All right. Uh, I see that it's already six o'clock, so I think we can probably uh, try to get this show on the road. Um, maybe we can start off by doing some um, introductions while some people are still joining. Uh, I can start with myself. So I'm Christops. Uh, some of you listening might already know me. I'm the product owner of UGCS currently here at SPH Engineering. Um, have been with SPH for quite a long time already, so th since 2014 through various projects. And uh, yeah, so currently uh, mainly responsible for making sure GCS is uh, one of the best flight planning solutions uh, there is. So that's what uh, we have been working with. Um, yep, yeah, then maybe uh, Josh and Dan, you can kind of uh, take over, introduce yourselves, and then we can get started with the webinar. Sure thing. Thanks, Christophs, and thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, and thanks for, to UGCS for, for hosting this. Uh, so my name is Josh Fowler. Um, uh, I'm an account manager here at Nerickson, so I'm leading some of our efforts uh, in Canada, the U.S., Australia, and New Zealand, uh, and, and continuing to, to expand as, as we go to internationally. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to Dan. Perfect. Thanks, Josh. And yeah, I echo what Josh said. Christophs, thanks for having us. Uh, looking forward to it this morning. Uh, so I'm the UAV operations lead here at Nerickson, and so you know, really my job is to ensure efficient and effective data collection uh, for our downstream team. So we have a machine learning team and a geomatics team that, you know, processes, processes this data and provides value to the, to the clients in the form of kind of dam safety inspection reports. And um, we'll, we'll be showing, showcasing a little bit of that later. But, uh, you know, my role is really working with drone companies to ensure that we can collect this data uh, repeatably and, uh, and effectively. So I'll pass yep. it back over. Well, all right. Thank you so much. Um, so I think usually in the webinars you now, not everybody can, uh, sometimes not everybody can stay until the very end uh, for our listeners. Um, but I can tell you one thing's for sure. So I saw the uh, presentation the guys have prepared and I think it's really, really interesting. Uh, so uh, even if you want to be able to stay until the very end, uh, we will also have the recording available on YouTube after the webinar. Uh, let me just maybe quickly go through the agenda here. So um, I'll do some brief introduction on UGCS and on SPH company. Uh, we'll get, then kind of move on over to working with UGCS software. So I'll show you and explain to you basically how, firstly, how do you connect your drone to UGCS? How can you do some custom camera configuration and camera actions? Um, next is how do you plan vertical missions? So basically, how can you use the vertical scan tool in UGCS to construct some simple missions? Uh, how to import elevation models and uh, maps into UGCS. And then we will move on over to guys from Nerickson, who will then tell you uh, in quite a lot of detail about uh, their experience in performing hydrodam inspections using drones and uh, data processing. And so then afterwards, we are also planning to have a Q&A during which you will be able to ask any questions that uh, you guys will have. Uh, approximate duration of the webinar we're planning, it will be um, approximately one hour. Uh, plus the Q&A section. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask from all of you is if you have some questions at any point uh, during the webinar, please put them here in Zoom. There's a separate uh, Q&A section, so please just put them in there and then we will either uh, answer them uh, in writing or we'll also answer some of the questions live. And then of course, once we go into the Q&A section, then we will just answer all of the questions uh, that we can live. And yeah, like I said, so the recording will be available on YouTube afterwards on our channel that's called GCS TV. So kind of briefly about SPH engineering. Uh, so currently we are working here uh, in the uh, sphere of UAVs since 2013. Uh, we're based in Latvia, in Riga, uh, and everything basically started from GCS flight planning software for drones. And then, you know, it kind of branched out. So currently we're working with UGCS, we're working with drone show software, uh, making uh, also very interesting drone shows all around the world. Uh, we're working with uh, integrated systems, allowing you to use different sensors um, on drones and also send drones on turn following flights. And then also we're doing a lot of these uh, custom projects. And so overall, uh, we have also a global customer and reseller network in about 150 plus countries, uh, and about 45% of our partners are located in North America. So um, you'll see GCS software itself in a bit. I'm sure a lot of you guys have already probably seen it, but some of you, uh, I'm guessing, may have not. So I'll just showcase it also. But before that, 
Uh, I'll just explain briefly about uh, some of the licenses, mainly the pro license and the trial that we have. So basically pro license, it's our most affordable license. So it allows you to plan flights with terrain following. This is one of the main features people are looking for when getting your software. Also, this allows you to use a uh, digital elevation model import in the form of TIFF files, as well as you can use 3D model import from KMZ. You can uh, create routes from KML, CSV, uh, as well as, yep. Yeah, so the topic of this webinar, of course, is vertical scans. You can do vertical scan missions with the GCS Pro, as well as photogrammetry missions, uh, corridor mapping, and a lot of other stuff. So um, those have tutorials on our YouTube, how to do everything. And plus, you can just go to shop.gcs.com, take a look at it, and uh, yep, yeah, uh, see if GCS Pro is right for you. If you're not yet sure, you can always uh, kind of go for our 14-day trial. This is what we uh, also launched quite recently. So here uh, in this new like trial license, there's no need for any payment info. You can just go to the site, uh, just get the trial, um, just enter your email, you'll have it, and you'll basically have the full functionality, uh, including everything that's in the GCS expert. So also we have our LiDAR tools, LiDAR area corridor, as well as LiDAR IMU calibrations. So for any of you guys working with LiDAR sensors this, and maybe looking for some flight planning software, this might be a good solution. So for this one, you can just head on over to gcs.com and uh, get it today from there. Okay, so now uh, let's move uh, into the uh, software itself. So here you can see GCS, flight planning software. Uh, first off, as I promised, uh, let me explain to you a bit about how do you connect drones here. Uh, so basically, most of our customers are using DJI drones. And for DJI drone connection, you need to use UGCS for DJI Android app. So the Android app, it's available from our website. I'll just quickly pull this up here. So you can go to gcs.com, then you can go here. And so then download the GCS for DJI for Android. Um, you can either download this from Google Play Store if your drone is uh, not the smart controller, if it's just like the normal RC controller. Um, so you can just go to Google Play and get it. Alternatively, you can also just uh, use the direct download option. This will allow you to download the uh, APK file. And then if you're using something like, let's say DJI M300, you can simply put the APK file on the smart controller, install it. And then basically you just need to make sure that your computer as well as the smart controller or the Android mobile device are on the same network. Um, once they're on the same network, then the drone will basically appear here in GCS. So this is kind of how it will look like. So all quite simple. You just get the Android app, make sure both devices are on the same network and you will be able to work with your drone and the GCS. If you're using uh, a drone that's not a non-DGI drone, then you can simply plug in some standard data link we also support the uh, autopilot uh, PX4 drones, so it's also not an issue. So um, let's maybe kind of get into flight planning with UGCS. So basically here, everything that's on uh, the uh, right side of the screen is concerning your drone control and everything on the left side is concerning your route planning. So now to plan the route, you can go here, click on the plus button to add a new route. Let's maybe call it vertical scan. And so then here in the list, you just need to choose the drone profile that you're using. Uh, in this case, we will be using the DJI M300 drone. Go next, click on OK. And so now you can see all of these tools that you can use for uh, planning your flights. The most simplest one, the simplest one is the waypoint tool. With this one selected, you can simply hold down the shift button and click to place waypoints like so. Uh, even though it's simple, it can be quite versatile and uh, guys later on also in the webinar will show you why and why also this tool is very good for vertical scans if you need to make some custom adjustments. And then to each of the segments here planned in UGCS, you can also add different actions such as, you know, to set, uh, set the camera to trigger every number of every certain number of meters, every certain number of seconds, to change the drone's yaw, uh, set point of interest, uh, weight actions. So all of this is configurable here. Um, then may maybe moving on to the vertical scans themselves. Let me just remove this. And so here, of course, you can also do photogrammetry missions in the GCS, uh, allowing you to basically map certain areas. An another thing that's quite useful before you do the vertical scan flights, because uh, if the structure is not very high, then this allows you to basically get a more detailed map before you do the vertical flight plan. 
Uh, but so now you can see I have a uh, 3D model of a building imported over here. And so now we can proceed to planning the vertical scan mission. So for this, we can go here to vertical scan. And so now you can see that for this drone, I currently have the DJI Zenmuse P1 camera selected. So in GCS, uh, you can select which cameras are assigned to which drones, and you can need, uh, also add custom camera profiles. So if you go here to, um, to menu and then main menu, you can see here that under, uh, under payloads, so basically these are all the cameras that we have here in EGCS. If your camera is not here for some reason, then you can press here on create new and you can create a custom camera profile for your own camera. The next, if you go here to drone profiles, then for the drone profile where you want to use this camera, you can simply go here, then select it, click here on add, and then again, click here on add item. And so then here in this list, you can basically choose what camera you want to add, uh, add it, save the profile. And then when you'll be doing the flight planning, then the parameters from this camera will be taken into account when the flight plan will be created. So this we can just cancel and yep. So now uh, let's move on into the vertical scan tool. Uh, I'll now just kind of pre create a preliminary one and then I'll show you kind of how you can make some adjustments to it and basically what can you change. So again, uh, process very simple. You hold down the shift button and then basically you place this around the object that you want to scan and press the enter key once you are done with it. So you can see this is just kind of like a rough uh, first first draft, if I can say it like that. And so now you can go in and basically adjust it in a lot more detail. So I think especially creating vertical scans here, it's quite easy because uh, the software, it's not cloud-based. So everything's working locally on your own uh, hardware. And plus you have this 3D interface to play around with. Because uh, UGCS, probably, I'm not sure how many of you uh know this but uh you just has actually built on top of a gaming engine so um yeah basically it's um works quite smoothly and uh gives you a lot of uh, customizability on uh, your flight plan so for example now you can see that i have put these lines around the building that i want to scan so now i can kind of zoom out a bit and we can take a look at the parameters that you can change in this case. Uh, first off is the turn type. In this case, I'll leave it to stop and turn, but you can also set it to adaptive bank turn, although this is something you normally use for horizontal missions. Uh, next, you can set the minimum and the maximum height. So minimum height in this case is 10 meters. Usually you would set it at such levels so that it would clear any trees or obstacles that are around the building. And next, then the maximum height, you can, of course, set uh, corresponding to the maximum uh, height of this object that you're trying to scan. Uh, next, you have the parameter distance to the facade. And if you're not sure what is distance, also then you can go here to our distance measurement tool. And so then you can place one point here and one point here. And so now you can kind of see roughly how far it will be. Let's just try to grab it here. Okay, so this is about nine meters over there. So I might need to move the line just a bit further. So basically in the vertical scan tool, uh, what you're entering there is you're entering what should be also the distance the facade because this distance parameter, this is the one that basically uh, then can based on this parameter as well as based on the camera you'll be using, the software will automatically calculate you know, what should be the spacing between the flight lines. So now I have this, so this should be now roughly 10 meters. Of course, you know, ideally you would measure it all around, make sure the distance is even all around the object, but it currently seems that this should roughly be uh, like so. So for the demo, I think this should be fine. And then you can move on into the forward and the side overlap values. So this, of course, will then affect uh, what will be the overlap uh, between the images. So for example, we take the side overlap and then we increase this. So now this should uh, make the, yeah, so you can see this, the lines here now are a bit closer, thus increasing the overlap between the images. And so, yeah, with forward, forward overlap, this is quite similar. Uh, there are also two uh, different patterns 
that you can use. So here by default, I currently have the vertical pattern selected and um, vertical pattern basically it's recommended for scanning uh, kind of these like uh, taller uh, objects. And then for some longer objects, you might prefer to use the horizontal scan. So in this case, you can see we can simply change the pattern from vertical to horizontal. And so now you can see how this has changed. Um, plus additionally, one thing is that uh, might make sense, might maybe make sense to show it now because in GCS, so all flights, they're done with terrain following. Of course, you can choose to not follow the terrain as well if you want to fly according to the median sea level. However, uh, if you want to see the elevation profile of the route you have constructed, you can go here into parameters and then show elevation. And so here you'll now see the elevation profile, which is also quite interesting depending on, uh, for example, what pattern you're using. So currently you can also see the estimated flight distance, total estimated duration, uh, waypoint count, as well as the minimum and the maximum altitude of this flight. So for example, here you can see how the drone is starting from 10 meters and then moving up to 64 meters in this case. And then if we change this from horizontal to vertical, so now once it calculates, you should see how this has now changed. So now this looks like a very nice line you'd see on an oscilloscope. Um, yeah, so that's um, basically how you can also view the uh, elevation change in GCS. And obviously when you're planning flights in more mountainous areas, then you'll be able to see this a lot, uh, a lot better. And so now let's me kind of move a bit further here through the parameters. So then also we have the vertical speed. Uh, currently it's at three meters. However, if you want the drone maybe to fly a bit slower, you can also then decrease this. And then also you have the horizontal speed, which well, in this case, this uh, doesn't make that much of a difference. This is more for the horizontal patterns, but of course you can also then change this. Uh, also here you have the checkbox follow terrain. So you can choose for the drone to either follow the terrain or not, obviously. And then last but not least, you also have the AGL tolerance parameters. So this basically governs um, what change in the elevation will make the software add an additional point. Meaning that let's say if you set the flight at, for example, 10 meters, and then the elevation, let's say, changes uh, by more than uh, by more than three meters, then the GCS will place an additional point. If you want there to be more additional points, and so the drone follows the terrain more closely, then you can decrease the AGL tolerance, and thus you'll basically achieve a more accurate flight. Uh, also here you can see that by default already we have these two actions added. So first one is the set camera attitude action. So this basically kind of centers in the camera on the drone, although in this case, I'll, let me just remove these values. It's better to kind of leave them blank and just leave the tilt values. This means that the camera will, on the M300, basically will be kind of set to kind of point straight at the object or the building that you're scanning. Uh, next is the set camera by distance. So and this basically means that the drone will trigger the camera every few meters. Uh, personally, I prefer to also use sometimes uh, set camera by time. So in that, that case, you can simply delete that. And so then you can go here and add the set camera by time action. And so now if you go here to where you have uh, this log, so here also you can see that you have the set camera by time action. You can see how many shots will be taken in total. Uh, how often will they be taken? Um, yeah, so that's um, essentially as far as planning simple uh, vertical scan missions, this is it. Um, but then I can also show to you a few more things which are quite interesting, I think and GCS. Um, I hope I have the data already loaded here, I should have. So basically, um, by default, in GCS, we're using uh, the map from Google. So here you can see we're using Google Satellite as the base map. And the elevation, we're using the SRTM4 uh, elevation source. And you can also see as I'm clicking on it, so it's basically being highlighted. Uh, but you're actually also able to import your own map into GCS. So let's say if you fly a certain area, you can scan it. We also have uh, our own processing tool called GCS Mapper. And if you want to find out more about that, you can go here. So mapper.ugcs.com. You can also watch videos on it, see how it works. But basically it's quite simple. You only select the folder where you have the images, then you select the output folder, and then the images are being processed. So for example, here, I already have the overlay from GCS Mapper imported. You can then select that, click on focus. And so here you can see how it looks like. Let me just close the window here so you can maybe see it just a bit better. 
And if we zoom in here, you can also see the uh, difference in the level of detail. Let's say if you compare, have Google satellite map, looks like in this specific place, this is actually where our office is uh, near uh, Riga. And then of course you can zoom in and see the uh, level of detail that you can get with the GCS mapper. And so, especially since mapper can also be used when you are offline, because it's also just working locally on your computer. Uh, we basically have designed this as a quick uh, tool that you can use when you're in the field. Um, I've also used mapper when we were in the middle of nowhere in Greenland, when we simply had to like uh, stitch together the images to create the map. Uh, an up-to-date map that we could use in a location where on Google Maps you just see, you know, just everything totally white and covered in snow. So it's a very good solution. I think um, if you need something that can process all the data locally without the need to access the internet, which by the way, also when you have to fly with UGCS in locations where there's no internet, you can also do that. So at any point here, you can click on offline map and then the map in the radius of one kilometer will be cached. Plus, additionally, now we're actually, we're about to release the next version of UGCS. It's called UGCS 4.9. And in that, actually, we will have as an experimental feature, the ability to select custom map regions. So instead of catching simply this map in the radius of one kilometer, you will be able to catch maps uh, up to the size of 100 square kilometers. So you'll simply be able to plug and plot the points here on the map and then catch the map and elevation for offline use. But going back to kind of where I was, so here you can see our office here in GCS. That's basically the overlay that was imported here from Mapper. And then if you go here to Map Options and Map Layers, also you can see we have this source. So basically from the uh, Mapper data, also we are able to import the terrain elevation. So instead of having to use the default SRTM4 terrain elevation data, here in GCS, you can basically always use your own custom terrain elevation data if you need to perform these very accurate flights according to, well, basically to allow the drone to follow the terrain. This is something that you can do. Uh, it's especially important when you need to make these very high accuracy flights. And uh, for example, if you have something, some elevation data that's created based on LIDAR data, then also you can import that into GCS and basically plan very accurate flights using this feature. And so I think maybe speaking about accurate flights uh, might be time to actually kind of pass the torch on over to the guys from Nerickson here. Um, let me just kind of go on here back real quick. Um, most likely we'll come back to GCS once we go back into the Q&A section. Uh, I see there's some questions in the Q&A, so I'll... Uh, Actually, maybe let me see if I can maybe already answer some of them now, or uh, I think let's do the following. I'll answer the, the uh, questions that are here in text. And then in the meantime, I think let's move on over to you guys uh, so you can tell, because I know you have a lot of material that, um, or sort of say a lot of ground you want to cover here. So I think the quicker we start, the uh, the better. Sure. Yeah. No, thanks, Christoph. So I think that's a good segue of, of um you know, the level of detail that we require in, in our inspections, right, and, and our clients require. Uh, so that DEM import function that, that we use is, uh, is critical. And um, I'll, uh, uh, I'll be excited to share about that as well as Dan. Um, do you mind if I allow uh, screen yep. sharing? I'll, I'll stop my screen share now. And so now you can uh, share yours. Fantastic. So is this showing up okay? Yep. So what I'll do very quickly is just give you a brief overview of, of who we are as a company. And then I'll dive deeper into the specific case study uh, along with Dan about how we collect the data using UGCS, uh, as well as, you know, why this is important to some of the teams that, that we work with and our, and our clients. Um, so our team is Nerickson. Our, our mission is to make infrastructure safer. Uh, and we believe that by, by doing automated UAV flights to capture uh, extremely high resolution data uh, and then using AI to automatically map those defects and track them over time uh, is the key to, to making infrastructure safer um, and, and starting to digitize those assets. So I'm just going to give a, a quick overview on, on the growth of our company and, and where we stand. So we started in 2020 uh, in, in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, we had one client and worked on three projects. 
Uh, in 2021, we, we grew to have over 12 projects, and then we're on track this year for, for 30 projects. Uh, and so we specialize in, in hydro dams and spillways, uh, but we also work on, on bridges, concrete, airstrips, and, and other concrete structures. Uh, and one thing to note is, you know, we're an analytics company. Uh, I just want to, to make that clear off the bat. We basically, you know, we don't own any drones. Um, we partner with third-party drone operators to collect data according to, to our standards, you know, using UGCS. Uh, we take that data, we process it, uh, build 3D models, and then use artificial intelligence to, to map out all of those defects and quantify all of those defects um, on the structure. So you can think cracks, spalling, uh, and other types of concrete defects. So these are just a few of the partners that we've been very fortunate to work with across the world. Um, and, but before I, I kind of hand it off to Dan to talk about how we use UGCS and, and the specifics about this particular project, I want to give everybody a little bit of a, a tidbit on, on what the current inspection process is for these dams and concrete structures. Um, you know, a lot of times when they're doing these detailed crack maps to, to do a condition assessment of their structure, uh, you know, they're sending teams of, of engineers out onto the structure. Uh, they have a, a piece of paper with a drawing, an engineering drawing, an as-built drawing of the structure, uh, and they have a pen, and they're, they've got their ruler, and they're out there measuring these cracks, drawing them on this piece of paper, uh, and then writing down notes about the length and width of these cracks. Uh, so you can imagine for extremely large structures and, and structures with you know, thousands or uh, hundreds, hundreds of cracks, um, you know, this can be a, a very laborious and time-consuming process, right? And not to mention... Uh, costly financially, um, it's, you know, especially for these large structures where, where you're kind of covering thousands of square feet worth of, of concrete or square meters. The second point is, you know, personal safety is always a risk when these folks are, are up inspecting the structures. You know, sometimes they're, um, you know, have to, to rope up and, and put on harnesses to climb on the structure if it's a vertical structure like we'll be showing you today. Uh, but I think the most important part is, is actually repeatability. Um, you know, it, it's fantastic to have a, a, a crack map, um, you know, with pen and paper. But what we've noticed is, you know, over the years, you know, a new person comes on board uh, and maybe, you know, the cracks all of a sudden start to change, even though nothing might have actually changed in the cracks. Right. But just because there's a personnel shift or maybe a new consultant comes on to inspect the structure, all of a sudden a structure can you know, magically have massive changes from year to year, even though the previous five years, nothing had changed. And so having a, a digital reference that we can actually start to track and, and scientifically you know, map these changes is extremely important. And that's, that's where we come in. And so our idea was, can we pair a, a unique data collection architecture with which Dan is gonna talk about today, you know, using UGCS uh, paired with our you know, unique AI, um, assessment platform, right? To automatically map these cracks and track them over time. And what we're aiming to do uh, is make these assessments faster, but also more accurate and again, repeatable. So this is just, and of course, at the end of the day, the, the whole purpose is to make infrastructure safer. So, you know, if you're in the hydro or, or dam world, uh, most of you would be feel familiar with the, the failure of Oroville Dam in 2017 in Northern California. Uh, the, the spillway uh, had some hydraulic jacking, which means some water got underneath a slab and, and ripped it up, up the concrete. And so, you know, a, a big part of our technology is, is trying to address that and, and other failures in the hydro world. And, and dams aren't getting any younger, as is other infrastructure. And so we're trying to address that problem. Uh, but this is our unique architecture here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the civil engineering applications. And Dan's going to talk a little bit about the, the UAV um technical elements but you know we collect four layers of data the first being lidar um and as, as christophs eloquently put it you know the whole purpose of us collecting lidar is actually to build a digital elevation model of the structure and i noticed one of the questions in the chat was you know what if your your elevation data or isn't accurate right on the google earth srtm data and, and dan's going to talk a little bit about that but that's the whole you know we're doing extremely precise uh, measurements and, and precise um, flights. And so we need that digital elevation model, especially in these rural areas and these valleys where SRTM data can be extremely inaccurate. So that we use that LIDAR to help us plan our automated flight. And then we use three additional layers of data collected by the UAV. Uh, the first being optical imagery. 
uh, to help us identify cracks and, and uh, other surface defects on the concrete. The second being infrared to help us identify uh, what's called delamination uh, in the concrete, which is when um, in different layers of the concrete start to, to rip apart and, you know, within the concrete itself. Um, and then we also use infrared for leakage detection um, and seepage that might be coming through the dam. And then the final, you know, element here is our acoustic payload, which we've actually invented in-house, which actually impacts the concrete, records the, the sound. Uh, we, we send a stress wave into the concrete and then we record that sound that we send into the concrete and we again, see if it's delaminated or not. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Dan, who's going to talk a little bit about the, the technical elements of our, our data collection workflow, and then we'll show you some of the results. Great. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I just want to, I want to take a step back and, and just kind of define, you know, I'm the UAV operations lead here, but what does that mean for a company that doesn't own drones? And, and Josh, Josh already kind of spoke to it, but what we do is we, do, we, have, we partner with third-party drone providers and collaborate with them on data collection. Or, you know, for asset owners out there that, that may have internal drone teams within their, within their company, uh, we can work directly with them as well to support the data collection. And, and the reason we've done this is that, you know, as Josh said, we're an analytics company. We want to focus on being software, but we also know that, you know, at this stage of the company, there needs to be, you know, a certain level of support, but also, you know, development and research into how to continuously improve our data collection methodology and solidify it. So I'll, I'll touch briefly again on, on the data layers that Josh mentioned, but what I really want to stress is that we're collecting this data at super high resolutions. And so, you know, our RGB data collection is around one millimeter GSD. And so for those that, you know, fly M300s with P1s, 35 mil lenses, that's about seven or eight meters off the, off the dam face or the, or the spillway. Um, and similarly with thermal data collection with an H20T as an example, we're, we're collecting that data at one centimeter GSD, which is about the same distance off the surface. So, you know, you can start to start to realize the impact and the, the importance of a, a really accurate DSM when we're flying this closely to the surface, but also this, you know, to the, to the ground level, but also this closely to the surface of the structure. Um, and, you know, working with these partners over time and, and developing this process, you know, what, we, what we're building is something called the Dronex Certified and Training Program. So, you know, for us to, to be able to inspect assets around the world, we need to partner with more drone providers. Um, but it isn't feasible for us to send an individual or two people to every single site, um, you know, especially as we begin to expand into the hundreds or, you know, multiple hundreds or thousands of projects a year. And so, you know, working with our drone partners um, and developing this process has, has led us to create a certification and training program that we can then kind of remotely train and, and certify pilots around the world to go and collect this data for us. And, you know, right before I, uh, I kind of jump into a UGCS demo, I, I also want to stress the importance that, um, you know, of, of the providers that we work with. And so, you know, specifically for this example that we're working with, uh, we were really fortunate to work with NB5 Geospatial and specifically Chief, Chief UAS pilot Chris Hipwood. And so, you know, I wanted to give him a shout out um, because he was the one really that, that did this data collection. We worked with him on the flight planning um, and I'm just using it today to kind of showcase what we can do. All right, Josh, next um, slide. So you guys, if, if, sorry, if, if I may, uh, if you could just quickly revert back to the previous slide, uh, we just yeah. have one question, the Q&A that I just saw, it's regarding the acoustics layer. So question is, mm -hmm. uh, what type of acoustic emission uh, are you using, active or passive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can answer that. Oh, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, so basically we have a, we, we can dive a little bit further into details on this, but uh, maybe after the presentation, but basically we have a, a striking sit. So think of, you know, very, you know, the current procedure that engineers use, I guess, let me give a background is they literally take a hammer like from Home Depot and they go hit the concrete and they listen for the sound feedback of the, the, of the concrete. And you can actually tell if you hit certain, you know, parts of the concrete that some concrete sound hollow. And so that's the exact same principle that, that we're replicating. So we literally make an impact on, on the concrete and then record the sound feedback. And now we have a geo-referenced map of where the delamination is. So that's a high level overview. We, you know, we have a few videos if we want to get into it later, uh, but hopefully that, that answers the question. Um, so Dan, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. So I guess it is, it's an active sensor uh, producing kind of discrete values that we can, we can make into heat maps and, and other things like that. Um, okay, so yeah, back on to, you know, custom DSM versus SRTM, and we'll dive into UGCS to really show the importance, but this is an arch dam that we scanned in Colorado, a different one uh, than the one that we're going to be showcasing today, but you can see, like, 
the 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 impact of a uh, an inaccurate DSM on the left compared to kind of our our custom built 3D model that we did on site is, is drastic. So I think now's a good time, Josh. Maybe I'll take over screen share from you, and I can very quickly. Here we go. Okay. Just want to make sure everybody sees my UGCS. Uh, here. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So. Here is our, our arch dam structure that I want to kind of use for this case study. And so we had a team come down here uh, last year to collect this data, as I said, with Chris Hipwood with MB5 Geospatial. And, you know, the first thing I want to point out is let's look at the, um, let's look at the SRTM data, right? This dam is basically flat. It's a, just so everybody knows, it's a 150 foot tall dam, so around 40 meters, uh, 650 feet wide but you don't get any of that resolution from this SRTM data, you know, and if, if we even look at the, uh, the elevation data down here, the top of the dam is saying 2.61 kilometers and the bottom of the dam is also saying 2.61 kilometers. So, you know, just a little sneak peek, if we were to put a vertical facade flight on that, you know, what is that actually, what is that actually scanning? Um, nothing. And so, so that's where, you know, our first layer and our first step is let's collect that LIDAR, Let's collect a, a high-level 3D model, and so we'll just use a we'll use the scan tool in UGCS to collect that data. And the output of that is going to be, you know, a, a better base map, and so we can we can tack on our base map here, so a more accurate base map uh, from an imagery standpoint, but also a more accurate elevation model, which you're going to see here. So that's the highlighted in green. So I'll just close this off now, but now we can kind of come in, and now we can see. Just takes a second to load here and as i zoom in it'll kind of refresh itself but we can actually see there's some depth to this to this surface model now right so we've got you know at the top now we're looking at 2.61 kilometers again 2.62 and at the bottom 2.58 um, so there's our 40 meter difference now you know there's our 150 feet and so you know once we can achieve this step now we can begin to actually uh, build our flight plans so that's where we'll use UGCS's, UGCS's facade, school, facade scan tool. And so, you know, I won't walk through the exact build, but I'll show you kind of a few outputs. Um, so this is kind of the first, the first step. So the first step is to build that facade scan. Uh, just like Kristaps kind of said, you know, we, we move it along. I actually created kind of 11 different little scans here. You could have done it with one, um, but I found it just easier to manipulate one by one. And as you can see, we're, we're ensuring that the orientation of each facade is matching the, the surface of the dam, right? And so then the other thing we want to check is exactly what uh, Christophs was showcasing earlier. Oh, I just uh, correct that point there. Anyways, we'll just leave that for now. Um, which is, you know, how far away from this surface are we? And so I said earlier that we need to be about eight meters away from the structure. And so as we're building this, you know, we're continuously, you know, placing points and ensuring that we're going to be eight meters from that structure and we're facing it directly to make sure that we're going to get that one millimeter GSD uh, imagery as, as we begin collection. So I'll remove that and I'll go back. So, you know, one thing though that we've learned using um, UGCS and specifically the facade scan tool is that because you're setting your minimum heights and your maximum heights off for the entire facade, uh, what can happen is if your if your elevation is changing drastically, as we can see here, you know the drone is kind of up on the side of the bank compared to the bottom of the the canyon here, is that we have varying heights all the way around, and you know a lot of times, um, you know we're kind of scanning nothing up in this top area. So one thing that we do to kind of manipulate or, or change the data in the sorry in the mission plan in the post is we actually convert it to a waypoint mission. So I'll show you what that looks like. And the reason we convert it to a waypoint mission is now we can actually go in and we can adjust all of these top waypoints to ensure that we're not, you know, scanning any extra time, wasting batteries, taking unnecessary photos. Um, but it's important that we create the mission in the facade scan tool for two reasons. One is your overlap, right? If we were just to go out there and produce a waypoint mission, it would be a nightmare trying to ensure that we had a consistent overlap that we desired for our model building. And the second is orientation. So as you know, as I said earlier, this, this flight mission is actually bowed to match the surface of the dam. If we were to just create a, a waypoint mission, we would have to individually change all of those waypoint lines and to ensure that our orientation matched um, the surface of the dam. 
Rather, you know, when we build it in the facade, it's pretty easy with these big arrows. We can actually just adjust it quite simply and it doesn't take as long. So that's kind of our, our process step. We, we build it based off the facade, but then in the end, we're really building kind of this, this um, really accurate waypoint mission, um, if anything. And, and we really like the, uh, you know, the ability to kind of manipulate all of these. And it's, it's, uh, it's really easy once you convert it in the post. Um, so a similar process for our thermal data, we'll, we'll create a very similar mission profile just like this, and we'll change the sensor over to thermal. Um, and then beyond that, with the acoustic data collection, uh, we are actually testing some UGCS kind of waypoint automated flight planning missions uh, with it for, for nadir spillways, so anything kind of flat. And, uh, you know, we are looking at also other, other options for potential vertical scanning um, where the, the drone is, you know, coming up in close contact with the dam surface. Uh, on an automatic, automated basics, on an automated basis, which will ensure you know repeatability for data collection in the future. So I'm going to stop sharing there. That's kind of the uh, how much I wanted to cover in UGCS. But really, you know, where we want to go to here is let's show a couple of videos of of what that of what that flight mission um, actually looked like in real life. And so the video we're about to show you, Josh is going to bring up his uh, computer here is is of the, of the M300 at that dam uh, doing this automated flight, you know, eight meters off the dam wall. So you can see here, you know, as the, as the drone comes into focus here, so it's, it's automatically climbing at a, I think we, we had this one set to actually a meter and a half um, meters per second was our flight speed for data collection. And you'll see it kind of rise to the top here, stop at that top waypoint, you know, bank over to the, it's left. And then, and then come right back down, uh, ensuring that you have that, that side overlap. So, you know, scanning, a, scanning an asset like this, you know, 150 feet tall, 650 feet wide. Um, you know, in total, we did it over two days. Um, but in total, the data collection was actually, you know, just under, um, you know, about a day's worth of data collection. Um, we fly quite slowly to ensure we're so close to the wall that, we need to make sure that our we're not getting any motion blur, right? So with being that close, your photo frame is about eight meters by five meters. And so, you know, as you're flying down, you're you're covering quite a bit of ground in terms of the, the photo frame. So we fly quite slowly, taking really, really high quality images um, for our downstream teams to be able to run the run the scripts on and, and build really, really great models. So Josh, maybe uh, we'll just go to the next uh, uh, I'll, I'll just maybe quickly uh, intrude yeah. here. Uh, pardon me, uh, but I, I saw we had uh, actually two questions about sure. uh, specifically conversion of the vertical scan into waypoints. Um, mm. I'm not sure if you have. Uh, yeah. Or do you have UGCS on this uh, screen share still, or you need to change it? Because, anyways, I can maybe quickly just address this. Uh, yeah. So, firstly. Um, had two questions like, is it easy to convert to waypoints? Uh, answer is yes, it's really easy. You just select the route that you have. And then on the route, you can click on the gear icon, go into route options. And then there will be an option that says uh, convert to waypoints. And so then basically from whatever mission tool you have, whether it's, you know, vertical scan for the gram tree, um, it, by default, it's still like it constructs waypoints, right? And so then once you press on convert to waypoints, you'll get like a duplicate route that will contain only waypoints. And uh, so, um, Mark, uh, so you also have the like, that other question that you asked, and do you and then also have to convert back to vertical facade scan? Uh, answer is no. So you don't need to, in, in this case, uh, how the guys are using it, there's no need to like convert back. So in this yeah. case, they're simply flying with, uh, with the waypoints. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for stops. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, no need to convert back because within that, that mission now as a waypoint mission, you know, the, the orientation of those flight lines and, and everything connected to the facade is already built in. All you're doing is you're able to now manipulate the top and bottom ends, uh, which, you know, it took, I think it took like five minutes for us to convert all those top waypoints to the, to about five meters above the top of the dam. So it wasn't even time consuming by any means. Um, great. So we'll kind of move. So this is, uh, so that was the video of the, of the drone capturing data. And here's the output from a, you know, these are all the camera locations, as you can see, for the entire structure. So, you know, without, I'll say it again, without the vertical facade scan tool and the ability to import this DSM, we wouldn't be able to have such a uniform automated flight for such a huge surface. Um, it really is critical for the work that we're doing. And, and I think this is a great time for me to pass it back over to Josh. And, and you discuss, you know, okay, what are we actually doing with this data now? So over to you, Josh. 
Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Dan. And uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, getting back a little bit to the civil engineering perspective and what the, the value is from the civil engineering uh, world. <clears throat> um, I want to kind of go over some of the project goals and objectives just quickly and, and, and then kind of open it up for Q&A after that. Um, you know, kind of quick, you know, I think Dan mentioned this a little bit earlier, but structure dimensions, 150 feet tall, uh, 650 foot, you know, uh, crest length. So from end to end, and then a 15 foot wide, uh, you know, dam, you know, the goal here was, you know, using machine learning, we want to automatically map out all the, the defects and quantify all those defects, which in this particular case was, was cracking and spalling. Uh, we wanted to color code those cracks based on their width. And so, you know, I'll show you briefly what that looks like on our platform. And then I think most importantly, again, is uh, we want these flights to be repeatable. So we want to actually come back to this dam uh, in future years and start to see how the cracks and uh, and spalls are changing on this structure. And so now with this automated flight, you know, we can come back with a certain level of confidence to the same location um you know within about two to five centimeters depending on the, the rtk accuracy uh, we could take that same image and build that same 3d model um and so we're really excited about that that potential and then the other outcomes for the client is you know the field work here was completed i think dan mentioned the photogrammetry itself was two days you know we had a one day for lidar um, and we also used some of our, our acoustic technology on this site and so we we knocked down the the field work significantly so typically they would use that rope access mission, which would take, you know, two weeks. Um, and of course, most importantly, now we've got a repeatable mission that we can, we can deploy for future projects. Uh, so I just want to kind of show you the quality of the 3D model that we're able to get um, from that really technical data capture. And because we're able to fly so close to the structure, um, this is that uh, left abutment of that dam. Uh, you know, we process this all using context capture, uh, Bentley product. Um, and what you can see is, you know, we'll zoom in on some specific cracks on the structure, some specific spalls. You can actually see the rocks, uh, you know, within the actual spall itself, some wires coming out of the, the dam. Um, and as it zooms in, we'll, we'll be able to even see the actual, um, there's a deviation in the surface. So it's actually part of the dam is popping out. Uh, at the joints. And so we can even pick up on those minute, um, you know, defects, which are, which are really interesting to the, to the uh, asset owner. Um, but one thing you might be thinking is, you know, okay, you've got a really pretty 3D model, right? Now you've got all of these defects on this structure. What do we do with that? And so that's really where, where we come in is, you know, taking that next step, right? And some assets like this, you know, they've got so many defects going in manually and mapping out each one might be, a, might be really challenging. And so what we invented is our own, um, you know, platform. This is a cloud-based platform. And what we do is, you know, we convert this 3D model into a 2D uh, TIFF uh, that we can then map out all of our defects and quantify all of our defects on. So as we go through this quick video, uh, you know, what I'm going to do is turn on these defect layers, just like in GIS, where you turn on and off various defect layers. We have each defect, uh, crack defect has an ID number. Uh, each spall has a, has an ID number. We can turn on our thermal layer. Um, and we can see the leakage on that left abutment, uh, in these two locations here. Uh, and then we can turn on our delamination uh, layer, which we haven't shown you that acoustic device, but we were able to deploy our acoustic device on this dam as well. Um, and what we'll do is we'll actually zoom in. So this is about, you know, 300 gigabytes worth of imagery that we collected. So extremely high resolution uh, for a lot of computers. It's, it's difficult to load. But what we can see is actually the surface area of the spall. Um, we can zoom in and out with, with relative ease, you know, compared to using some, some other types of software. We can turn on our cracking layer. Um, and what we'll see is we can actually calculate the, the average width and the length of that particular crack. Um, and so again, you know, our, as I mentioned, the whole purpose of this is for it to be repeatable, right? And so we'd like to come back in, uh, in 2024. So, you know, let, let the structure de deteriorate for a year or two. And now we'll add a, a 2024 layer on, and we can start to see have these cracks changed. Um, and so kind of, you know, wrapping up uh, again, we, we can do some really cool 
analysis, you know, now that we have this level of data, which is really unprecedented because with rope access and, and manual methods, you really can't measure all of these cracks and you can't, can't map them all out. There's just not enough time and not enough money in the world to do that. But now, you know, using a UAV, we can actually do that. And so we can get, you know, record levels of data, which, you know, what you see here is, is a, what's called a rose map. And so this actually shows us the orientation of each crack. Um, so, you know, this would, the, the, the closer the bar is to the end of the circle is the, the amount of cracks in that particular region. So as we can see here, most of the cracks go from left to right here. But as we go to this left side, you know, most of the cracks, you know, there's actually an even relatively even distribution here of, of cracks that go from, from left to right as well as up and down. So that's pretty interesting. It's just additional insights that we can provide to, to our consultant, our engineering consultant partners, as well as, you know, the asset owner to, to help them make the best decisions for repair and maintenance and, and dam safety. Um, and again, just touching on, on this, the, you know, we wanted to use UGCS's capabilities to really repeat these missions over time, right? We've got that DSM, you know, in future missions, we're gonna re-import that same DEM, re-import that same flight plan. And now, you know, when we go back to these structures, we, you know, I literally at the click of a button, we can repeat that same flight plan um with relative ease right so the first time is always a little little tough you got to tweak the mission to the the certain uh nuances of the of the site right avoid the rocks trees buildings uh power lines but now that we've got the flight plan you know we can very easily re-import that and, and then start to capture these data over time these are some of the the partners that we've worked with across uh, the united states and canada um you know, some of the large ones, Denver Water, MB Power, USACE, and, and the, the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, and we're really excited to expand this. Uh, and so I'd encourage you as I, as I kind of wrap up here uh, to reach out to Dan and myself. You know, we'd love to, to answer any questions um, or, or walk you through. Uh, you know, we're always looking for partners, um, you know, and uh, we'd just be curious to learn more about what you all are up to. So with that, maybe I'll turn it back over to... Uh, to Christophs and uh, we'll go from there. Yep. So uh, thank you, Josh, so much. Um, I see we have one. Uh, this question actually was put in the chat. I think this wasn't in the Q and A, and I think it's quite an interesting one. So um, Jackie is asking, uh, how do you cover the photos uh, near the ground and near the edges of the dam? Like, do you do these areas manually or robustly? How how do you do this? How do you solve this problem? Definitely. Um, so really, it all depends on your your trust and your comfort with the DSM that you brought in, right? Um, so if you do a survey grade DSM with control points um, that you've surveyed in and it's perfectly referenced, um, then you can trust the model quite well. So actually for this project, we did have control points on the top of the dam and the bottom of the canyon to, to bring added accuracy to the model. Um, but I don't know, you might have seen when I was when I was sharing the data that the, the kind of the powerhouse at the bottom of the dam didn't really come through in a super accurate manner. And so our pilot, Chris, uh, he actually decided to, to bring up, you know, above the height of that powerhouse and do the automated flights above that. And then we did a manual flight along the bottom. That being said, you know, learnable for us, you know, how can we make sure that that powerhouse is accurately collected in the LiDAR data set and, and ensure that it comes through properly? That's one, but right. also secondly, you know, being able to, you know, if we are a little concerned about that, using the tilt function, uh, you know, bringing that camera angle down a smidge. So it might be five or six meters off the ground at that base layer, but capturing the bottom of the dam and not really sacrificing a GS, a resolution from a GSD perspective. Um, okay, let me then, I'll just share my screen again. Hopefully you should be able to see it. So I think, yep, um, basically now, I think we're kind of in the Q&A part of the webinar. Uh, so it would be really good. I see we uh, still have quite a lot of listeners here. Uh, if you have any questions, maybe something that wasn't really clear, wasn't really fully explained uh, during the webinar, maybe you just have some other questions about, you know, scanning, vertical inspections, or flight planning in GCS. You can just put them all in the Q&A section. Uh, I think in the meantime, since there were some questions about uh, converting routes to waypoints, maybe you can, while you guys are writing your questions, I can just quickly address this and basically just show to you how it can be done in the GCS. Uh, so for example, here uh, you can see I have now the vertical scan flight that I constructed earlier that most of you probably already saw. 
And so if you want to convert this to waypoints, it's quite easy. So you can go here to parameters, and then here is the option route to waypoints. So we can just click on that. And so now you can see we actually have two routes here. So one is this original one, this vertical scan. You can click here on the eye icon to basically kind of hide it or show it. So in this case, I'm going to hide it. And so now we have this copy of this route. So now basically we can also maybe rename this. And so now we can just move on and closer. And so now we can make some more in-depth uh, <coughs> some more in-depth adjustments here. So for example, we can take, let's say at this point, and we can actually, in fact, hold the control button. We can then select multiple waypoints, like so. And then for these points, we can set an exact altitude at which we want them. So let's say we can set them to 40 meters and well, then they are set lower. Um, oh, sorry, this was the aim cell. Let's set them to AGL instead. And now let's do 40. Yep, so kind of like that. And so then basically you can select any points that you need, that you need to adjust and you can do the same thing on them basically. So similarly, you know, you can basically go through all the others here and also make any adjustments that you need uh, plus also with this tool, what you can do is you can also add actions to them. So you can add, uh, you know, if you maybe need the camera to face a certain way, uh, then also it's not a problem, you can do this. So for example here, also uh, let's set the altitude mode to AGL and the altitude to 40. So yep, this is basically how you can do all of these adjustments. So this is how I adjusted the top waypoints. And then if you wanted to, you can also adjust the bottom waypoints here. Okay, so as you already have here some uh, questions. Uh, so first one is how do you, uh, from Miles, so how do you compensate for obstacles in the flight path? I assume you guys can also tell a bit from your experience, uh, how did you specifically deal with, you know, when you have to do these dam inspections, how do you deal with when there is like some obstacle maybe like down below uh, yeah. where you have the lowest point? Yeah, I can answer that a little bit. Maybe Dan can answer too. But, you know, speaking specifically about this, this project in, uh, on this Arch Dam, you know, we were very fortunate to be using the M300, uh, which has obstacle avoidance capabilities. And so, um, you know, the M300, if it, if it encounters a, an obstacle, it'll automatically stop uh, along the flight plan, you know, within a set number of meters, right? Um, and so, you know, if that happened, what we could do is then tweak the flight plan accordingly, uh, to, to make sure we don't hit that obstacle. So it is a little bit of a tweaking, uh, uh, you know, issue that said, if you're not using a, uh, an M300, you know, it, it really helps to have a, a second VO, uh, with you to, to make sure that, that, uh, you're not hitting any obstructions. Um, Dan, is that, uh, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you kind of lightly touched on it, but I think that's just comes from like uh, really accurate mission planning, right? And being aware of your surroundings. Um, and that's why, you know, being able to view the 3D space with a high accurate DSM and, you know, a, you know, a relatively high resolution uh, ortho can, can allow you to kind of view it from a different perspective. And so, you know, understanding power lines ahead or, or different, you know, things coming out from the side walls like a rock, a, uh, a rock jutting out or something like that to be aware of it. You know, when we come into contact with this a lot and we're doing uh, spillways because, you know, a lot of spillways have kind of like a little bridge deck running over them. And we want to do an entire automated flight. And a lot of times we're actually below the spillway walls. Uh, we're flying so close to the, to the dam surface. And so ensuring that, you know, our DSM is picking up that, that, that bridge into the drone, you know, is, is understanding where that obstacle is. We're not actually mission planning all the way to it. Um, and I think Josh, I don't know if you have a great video of that. Um, uh, I don't know if you have it on hand or not. Maybe you can bring it up in a little bit, but uh, just being aware of that when you are mission planning, that's what makes a good mission planner, I think, in my mind. And I think it looks like Miles had a follow on was how does it affect data quality? Um, so maybe we can just answer. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that it impacts is, is repeatability. <laughs> I mean, if worse comes to worse, we can always, I think there are other things in photogrammetry and data capture that impact the quality more. Um, but I think, uh, you know, worst comes to worst, you just do a manual flight and capture the imagery to, with enough overlap. Right. And so it really, it impacts the, the repeatability, which is a big thing that we're going towards and is, you know, let's do this repeatedly so that we can start to monitor the changes. Um, so that, that's, that'd be the biggest thing. Anything, 
that you add to that, Dan? Yeah, no, that's uh, no need to add to that. Good. Just looking at another question here from Michael. Uh, did Nierickson use LIDAR for their mission to create a 3D model or was the P1 context capture the best option due to Zerdry Yaw needed pointed towards the dam face? Uh, we did use LIDAR for this mission. Um, definitely preferred for us. Um, uh, that being said, you know, with some really high end uh, GCPs and some, and some, you know, some survey, survey grade uh, GCP creation, you can do it with photogrammetry, uh, but we just prefer LIDAR. It's a, it's a better data set um, that we like to use. Is noise ever an issue in the DSM? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think this is something that, you know, Chris probably managed on site um, when he was actually processing that LIDAR data. And so just ensuring that um, the noise that we were getting, you know, what is noise and what is reality? Um, that's definitely something that that we have to manage, and, and I think he managed with this with this project. Um, I see there's another interesting question from um, Mark. I'm not sure if you guys can answer this uh, in or how much experience you have with this specifically, but basically Mark's asking, so what's the best way to uh, kind of combine the vertical facade uh, capture with nadir or obliques to kind of create an accurate uh, 3D model? So let's say if you want to scan a building with a roof, mm -hmm. maybe you guys, uh, obviously this is a bit of a different topic, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, not outside our realm by any means. I mean, this is kind of no different than doing a bridge, in my opinion, right? Like bridge piers, undersides, uh, doorway <laughs> sidewalls. Yeah. yeah, the sidewalls, the decks. Um, so yeah, I think uh, Mark, from from our perspective and, and our experience, is just ensuring that between those different missions, you're getting the appropriate overlap, right? And so you can do the entire facade. Um, you know, with that camera pointing directly perpendicular at it, but then you also need to make sure that you have your oblique photos, like you've mentioned, yeah. uh, covering the other end. And then you bring the, the nadir on top of that. Uh, we did a bridge project a couple months ago and we, you know, we, we really kind of focused to ensure that we had all these angles uh, accounted for when we were collecting the data and the, the middle piers turned out great, you know, four sides of a middle pier uh, with the bridge deck on top. So um, just ensuring that you have that overlap between those models, I think is uh you can always, you know, you can always trim photos back, I guess is what I would say. So better to over collect in the field and, and kind of trim it back up in the office than under collect uh, and, and face the consequences when you get back to the office. And then uh, to Michael's question, we actually used a, a Regal. We did not use the L1. Um, so it was a pretty heavy duty. I think it was like a two or $300,000 Regal LiDAR sensor. Um, instead of the, the L1. The L1 does, I'll let Dan comment on the L1. He knows more than I do, but uh, but yeah. Yeah, we've used the L1 before. Um, I mean, it's so so easy, right? It's so plug and play with the M300. Um, yeah, it's super dense point cloud for sure. The accuracy isn't as high. So I think, um, you know, talking with Chris actually specifically, like using some LiDAR and using the L1, we're, we're really kind of starting to lean towards uh, ensuring that we have some GCPs uh, placed and some LiDAR ground control points to make sure that these models are, are super accurate. Since you mentioned LiDAR, let me do a quick uh, <laughs> yeah. plug here, <laughs> a quick pro product plug. Um, so uh, for those who, of you who might not know this, so basically for GCS, we have three different licenses. So the one I mentioned here uh, kind of earlier in my presentation was the GCS Pro. So this is the one, you know, the, where you also have the, uh, the vertical scan tool, photogrammetry, and so basically it has all of the base features. You can just go here to shop gcs.com and find it. But specifically for LiDAR, actually we have GCS Expert license. And so for the Expert license, what we have is firstly, we have uh, LiDAR area and LiDAR uh, corridor missions. And in these, uh, the uh, nice thing is that you can plan these based on the field of view angle of the LiDAR sensor um, you can just input there, you know, as you're planning the mission, plus you can adjust the corner radius of the mission as well as you can do loop turns in these flights. So LiDAR area and LiDAR corridor, which allow you to also additionally calibrate the IMU of the LiDAR. Plus, uh, we also here have uh, two new tools uh, for uh, calibrating the IMU. One is the pattern tool that's available within the mission. And another one is uh, kind of a dedicated LiDAR calibration action where we have the figure eight and where we have the uh, U-turn calibration. Um, by the way, for those of you who will be taking the UGCS trial, the free trial after the webinar, 
uh, the trial will be on the expert version. So you can go here to shop, then subscriptions, and then here you can get the trial. Uh, and then basically, once you get it, you will also have access to the LiDAR features. So you'll also be able to you know, use them, play around with them, and uh, see how do you uh, like them. And we support actually most LiDAR sensors, including the L1, the Regal, Yellow Scan, and many, many others. So we don't really have any restrictions in that sense. Uh, main thing here is that the LiDAR tools, for now, they're working with uh, DJI, uh, like, like these larger DJI drones, so M300. M600 and M200 and 210 series. So thank you. That was, that was my product plug. We can move on further with the Q&A. <laughs> you have to. Uh, do, do we want to answer James's question? He's been, to be honest, I don't know James about telecom towers. Um, yeah. we, we specialize in the concrete side of things, but we've heard all kinds of stories about different ways to collect telecom, including like just pure RGB. And then we've heard the opposite of you have to use a LiDAR base and then overlay the RGB on top of it. But uh, yeah, we're, we, we don't specialize in that. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, maybe I can go on to Sergey's question. Uh, yeah. Do you want to show the IR layer? Uh, yeah, Josh? I was just going to uh, pull open. Uh, maybe, maybe before we go into that, I see uh, just since we're kind of on the topic of LiDARs, I see Michael yeah, asked. Sure. So do you have like some picture of the Regal LiDAR sensor? And so he says, I quote, curious how they captured rel uh, relative to dam face at zero degree uh, yaw. Oh um, boy. <laughs> no, we, don't have, we don't have a picture. Um, Michael, what I'm gonna ask is, I think I put my email, maybe I'll, I'll toss my email back in the chat that way everybody can see it. Uh, why don't you shoot me an email afterwards and, and I can, uh, I'll, I'll reach out to Chris and, and see exactly what he did and we can get back to you on that. How about that? Yep, and maybe you guys put both your emails in the chat because I yeah. saw there's also a question in the Q&A about that they were not able to get your contact information. But uh, in any case, don't worry, because also after the webinar, uh, we will basically send out a mailing. And so then also we will give uh, Dan's and, and, uh, and Josh's uh, these email addresses there as well. So just in case you missed it, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, plus, keep in mind that the webinar recording will be available on YouTube afterwards. So you can think, replay any part. Mm -hmm. Just while we're on LiDAR, I just want to touch on Adam's question too. It's really interesting. Um, so yeah, Adam, this is something that that we've been playing around with. And, you know, actually a, a pilot that we work with down in New Zealand, you know, this is kind of his preferred method. Um, they don't run DJI drones. And so um, he does exactly what you're saying, you know, a small LiDAR sensor on board to ensure that you're maintaining and, and using that for elevation and terrain following. Um, I think from our standpoint, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit more work maybe from the, from the get-go, but to know that um, we have that accurate DSM and, and that 3D model, which to be honest, the dam owners, you know, as a, it's kind of a, an easy value add for, for us to provide them at the end also, but, you know, to also be able to just show up next year and, you know, with that flight plan that I showed you, you know, all the work's done in the first year, we can show up next year, that RGB um, data collection is, you know, no longer than a day now that it's all dialed in. And we know that the camp, that, that drone is going to be at the exact same location, um, you know, the exact same elevation and the exact same distance from the wall at all times. Um, you know, it should be similar, I guess, with a, within a onboard ladder, you would think if it was following the same flight path and using an onboard ladder system, um, it would be the same. So yeah, I guess, you know, that's a, that's an, an answer, non-answer for you. Um, at this point where we are kind of sticking to a DSM generation, but uh, something for us to continue looking into. And if you have any thoughts on it, I mean, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, so feel free to reach out, Anna. Cool. So maybe we can shift to the, the thermal yeah. real quick. And Christoph, so you don't mind uh, me sharing my screen? Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, so to answer Sergey's question, I'm going to go for a live demo. Um, so this is that thermal layer on this particular arch dam. Uh, really worth noting that, you know, I think the, you know, I, I do have to caveat some of the thermal data. So thermal is very dependent on your, you know, weather conditions, right? So, you know, there, thermal is really useful for, for two items. You know, number one is, is water leakage, which is what you're going to see here. So this is a known, you know, area of leakage here. So you can see it's, it's pretty, um, 
you know, it's, it's in the formation of water here. And then this as well, which is, you know, extremely cold area uh, on the structure relative to some of the areas around it. It also picks up on some of the spalling, but, but we can do that visually. Um, and so, yeah, it is overlaid directly onto the RGB uh, ortho and uh, how we do it. We use magic. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, you know, those are our photogrammetrist experts. So context capture does have a way to overlay um, or to produce and overlay uh, thermal models onto RGB models. Um, so th these are two, you know, areas that, that we've used it in. Um, and then the other is, is just, I'll do a quick plug for delamination mapping. So these are known areas of delamination on a spillway. Uh, you'll notice that these are all joints. Um, so we were able to, to fortunately have really good weather conditions and we were able to capture some of this, uh, some of these areas. So you'll notice just a very slight uh, 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 color difference here or temperature difference, you know, right in these, these corners here. And then along this joint, uh, you know, you can notice this large, um, Piece of delamination and this is all actually validated so if you actually look closely there's a there's a piece of chalk here that actually outlines that you know this area on the structure so it's already been identified as a as an area that where repairs needed and then you know same thing here is you know this is a, a slight color difference here and we're able to pick up on that delamination uh, again you know very dependent on you know very useful right for, for identifying delamination which on spillway joints is a, is a big deal nowadays uh, especially after Oroville, right? Uh, because, you know, that's one of the hypotheses is there might have been delamination along the spillway joint, which caused uh, the, the, the concrete to be ripped up and, and, you know, the water was able to get under it because of the, the delamination. Um, but, uh, you know, again, very, very dependent upon the weather conditions. If you have water flowing down the center of the spillway uh, or, you know, any kind of poor weather conditions, so, you know, rain or, or snow, um, you know, it can be really challenging to, to identify and, and map out some of those defects. But great question. Okay, so um, if there are any more questions, you can put them in the Q&A. But I think now, at least so far, we have answered uh, most of them. Let's let me just wait just a few more minutes, uh, during which you can just maybe quickly, kind of again, uh, take you through what products we have. Uh, kind of going back here. Uh, yep. So basically, uh, if you want to find out more about UGCS, uh, quickest way is just go here to gcs.com. So here you are able to you know watch our videos, read about different features. Um, and then plus additionally, once you go uh, here to the pricing page. So then in here, you will also be able to take the free trial of UGCS for 14 days. And so basically be able to try them out. Uh, you can read more about each of the licenses if you click on them here. And so then you can see more detailed description of what uh, tools are included in here exactly. What do you get with GCS? Um, yeah, and so basically if you have any more questions, you can always drop us an email at support at gcs.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, so another thing I wanted to maybe just quickly tell you about is so on uh, Facebook, we actually have a group of GCS users. So currently there we have about uh, 2,100 uh, users of GCS. And so if you are not aware of the existence of such a group, uh, might be the time to join there because uh, uh, always, you know, our support team is working uh, to always help you, but they're still working within the working hours that we have here. Uh, and so if you maybe have just, just some questions to other drone pilots, like, you know, in this case, when you just want to understand maybe what, what ways of flight planning or what tools are people using to, you know, solve certain problems, solve certain tasks, uh, this is actually a good way, I think, how you can uh, try to interact with other uh, people in this, who have been in a similar situation, who have had to solve these problems, or, you know, simply maybe you, you just can't get something to work and then it's also one place where you can quickly get an answer to any question that you have regarding GCS, regarding some data processing as well, because I think there's quite a lot of uh, very knowledgeable people in the field. Um, so this would be over here. So on Facebook, you can also just go to GCS users, just like type in GCS. And I think then under groups, you should be able to see it. So we will be also waiting for you there to join. And uh, I'm also there very often answering different questions that you have. Uh, but yeah, I see there are currently no more open questions in uh, the, in the Q&A. So um, again, just want to thank everybody here for coming and for listening to the webinar. 
hope it was really interesting for you. Um, like I said previously, the recording of this will be available on YouTube. We'll also send you a mailing uh, where you will have uh, ours and guys from Nerickson contacts. So, um, yep, just uh, Dan and Josh, again, just want to give you a shout out and, and a thank you for participating in the webinar. Uh, for me, it was also really, really interesting to listen uh, and to see different, you know, it, it's a very innovative method, I think, what you guys have developed. And it's really, really interesting. I think not only for me, but for other people uh, listening here today as well. So, yeah, thank you, guys.